So uh, Romans 8.29 says this. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Trying to make this higher. Okay. So, we didn't just get saved to be blessed and get taken to heaven. But God's priority in our lives is to make us look like, act like, talk like, walk like Jesus. That is his main focus for our lives. Yes, he wants to bless you. Yes, he wants to heal your body and all these things make you great and all that. But he is after your heart and he wants to take what was wicked and deceitful and turn it into a beautiful heart. The one that beats like Jesus, his heart. Okay. Um, um, second, I mean, first Samuel says this. Uh, but the Lord, First Samuel sixteen seven says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance. Talking about who's the next king, you know. Samuel's picking a king. And the Lord's telling him, he's, he's, All of David's brothers are there, and David's not there. And they all look high and mighty, but David's not there. And uh, uh, he had to go find uh, the, the next king to replace Saul. And the Lord tells him, Hey, don't look at what man sees, maybe the, uh, the uh, appearance outward, maybe uh, his abilities, maybe his, his uh, you know, uh, intelligence, whatever, or his outward performance. But is his heart beating for me? Is he a man after my heart? Is he one who is humble, meek, and teachable? That's the one you're looking for. That's the one that I am going to use to shine my light the light of Jesus is the glory that the world needs for life, right? In him is life. And that light, um, that, that light is the life of men. Uh, okay. So, it's what's inside that's most important to God. Even outward success. It's great. God wants to give you outward success. He even wants to make you famous if it needs to be. He wants to do awesome things to your life. But what's the most important thing is inward success. A heart that longs, yearns, and is teachable, and that beats for him and like him. Okay? So what is a picture of a beautiful heart? Let's go to Matthew 5.1. I think if you can open your Bible to this section, I'm just going to stick to this section of Scripture. Matthew 5.1 through, um, I think it's 7 or 13. Okay, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. First one says, And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and he went and seated his disciples, and came to him. <laughs> what happened there? And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Now, he had withdrawn from the crowd. He had been ministering to large crowd. But now he's withdrawing from the crowd. Why? So he can speak to his disciples. The disciples are the ones that have already given their whole life to follow him. They've already paid the price. They've, this is what they live for, okay? The crowd, you know, the crowds come for many reasons. Some need healing. Some wants to see a, you know, a demonstration of power. Some wants to, to hear something new. Some want to see who, who's his miracle worker. Some are just, you know... But disciples are the ones that say, hey, we left all to follow you. Wherever you go, Jesus, we go. We follow. You are it. We live and die in you. And these are the ones he speaks these things to. And I don't believe maybe the reason why he can't speak these, these, these things that he's speaking to a large crowd because they won't get it. Maybe only the disciples will get it. Maybe only those who have a, a willing heart and a sincere heart can get what he's about to say, okay? And says, uh, verse 2, Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Bless. And the word here, I googled the uh, Amplified Bible because I want to know what, how they say it. Uh, the word bless 
in the Amplify means um, to be happy, envied, and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God, favor, and salvation, regardless of their outward condition or circumstances. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Those who are aware of their spiritual depravity, deficiency. Those who are needy and they know they have to grow in love. They know they have their hearts uh, are deprived. They know that spiritually there's so much more of God that they have not obtained. Even if they've done great things. Even if they know many things. Even if they're very well versed in the Bible. They know that there's so much more in this vast ocean of God they do not have yet. And they say, I am poor compared to what I could have. Now, of course, we have all things. We're seated in heavenly places. And we are made one with Christ. So all things are ours in the spirit, of course, you know. But in our living condition, we need to be poor in spirit. We need to realize that there's so much more, right? Okay. And there's, for theirs is, notice this is, is. That's present tense. Not will be the kingdom of of heaven. The poor in spirit have the kingdom of heaven living, moving, released through them. Okay? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comfort, comforted. Mourning is how we feel when we see the, when we see what our heart really is like. Godly sorrow. There's a scripture that says, um, uh, in 2 Corinthians 7.10, For a godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So what is the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow? Godly sorrow is given or inspired by the Holy Spirit. Worldly sorrow is by the flesh. You can be sorry for your sin, but it can produce more death. Right? When godly sorrow comes, we are convicted, we repent, we turn, and the Holy Spirit works in us a, a transformation that's supernatural, okay? Now, you know, we can, we, we can be condemned, and we know we're wrong, but that kind of condemnation is not, we can feel like shame and guilt and condemnation. That's not, and, and we can actually... Know that we're wrong, but that doesn't produce any life, right? But godly sorrow comes when we have a revelation and we're convicted of the goodness of God, of the beauty of God. And, and we realize we, we can't go on this way, okay? And the Holy Spirit works in us to will and to do. Okay. Um, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I looked up the word meek in the Greek. It means to be gentle. Humble. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek. That's the same word in the Greek. Pros. Lowly. Meek and lowly and of heart. And you will find rest for your soul. This is how you find rest for your soul. Rest is freedom from emotional traffic. Rest is when you can be still and know that he's God. When you actually... Have a connection with God, a vibrant spirit. You're alive in the spirit. Rest is when you're not anxious. You're, you're aware of the kingdom within and upon. Okay? And this is the yoke that you take. Learn. He says, learn from me. This is the most important thing in your life. Basically what he's saying. And this is the only thing he says about himself while he was on earth. As far as his characteristic, his personality. I am meek and lowly of heart. I think we should consider this, how important this is for us. If Jesus really, em, you know, emphasized this, right? Now, this scripture here, the meek shall inherit the earth, I believe is speaking mostly of the kingdom that is coming. The age to come. In ex, ex disease, whatever, how do you say that? How do you guys say that? <laughs> you know what it is, right? ECC. Uh, one generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Now, you'll hear doom and gloom prophets say the earth is going to, you know, be 
demolished and, you know, God's just going to take those believers to heaven and everybody's going to be, you know, doomed, you know. I don't think so. I think that, according to the Bible, it says that heaven will come to earth. He's going to establish his kingdom here. And the meek are going to be those that rule this planet with him. I mean, if you check, that's what it says, right? These are the ones that are going to have ten cities, five cities, two cities, I don't know. But your life here is an interim. The two seconds you spend here allowing Jesus to conform you into him will graduate you into your real life. The earth is like the womb of a baby, and you're really born when you die. I don't know if you know what I mean. And that is where your life really begins. Yeah, yeah, no, when we're born again, life begins here on earth. But it's just an intern. You will have assignments in heaven. This earth goes on forever. According to the Bible. Okay. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 41, it says, There is one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another the glory of the stars. And for the stars differ from another star in glory. So is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, is raised in corruption. What is this talking about? There's different realms of glory, right? That the moon is, is bright, but not as bright as the sun. When you're raised from the dead, some are going to be brighter than others. Some are going to possess more glory than others. How you live here determines your resurrection. It is the womb that determines your birth when you die. I mean, you know what I mean, right? So, why do we... Why, why, what should we invest in in this two seconds that we're alive? Compared to the billions and billions of years in our eternal... I, I, I don't think we can say eternal. I know that people say eternal. It's translated. But everlasting is probably more accurate. Because eternal is only reserved for God. Because he is pre-existed before anything, right? Everlasting. Okay. In Luke 9, 17, and he said to him, Jesus is saying to this good servant, Because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. So... If you're faithful in this two seconds, you're going to have authority in your resurrection. If you barely make it, you will be in heaven and it's glorious. But if you wasted your life here, you will regret it. And that's the only thing, that's the only bad thing about the resurrection is for those who kind of squandered their lives. I don't want to be one of those. All right? You guys getting anything out of this? I'm just trying to relax, group here, okay? All right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Those who are willing to do anything, give anything, no matter what the cost, for righteousness. They'll do anything. They'll to seek God and serve his purpose. You know, lack of hunger is just a sign that we're spiritually sick. Or maybe dying. A dead person is never hungry. A sick person doesn't want to eat. Okay. Blessed are the merciful. I'm going through this real fast because every one of these is probably a few hours of teaching on themselves. But I, I can't do that. You know, we'll be here until 3 a.m. Okay. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, uh, when you were mistreated, when you're cursed, Jesus commands you, encourages you to pray and bless them when you're mistreated. What about those who are hurting, who are in poverty. You know, I, I sometimes drive brown Bel Air, and they want to wipe my windshield. <laughs> and I just got a car wash, you know, and the guy wants, I said, no, 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 stop, stop, don't, 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 don't. Here's five bucks, you know, <laughs> give him five bucks. What's your name? Always ask them their name, because you'll remember more and you'll pray for them when you know their name, you know. Hey, what's your name? How are you doing? If I have time, I'll have a conversation. If I don't, so let me just say a quick prayer for you. Lord, help this guy, you know. Help my friend, whatever, you know. And say his name to him. That's, that's, a, that's a way that we can bless those who are hurting, you know. Uh, uh, what about those who fall into sin, even gross sin? Do we 
show them mercy or do we just kind of stay away and just like, you know, I'll, I'll talk to him when he gets around, you know. I, or <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> we don't, <laughs> sometimes we go there and we beat him up, right? <laughs> We're in the wrong spirit and we have a critical, judgmental, religious spirit on us and we become like Pharisees. But we're supposed to show mercy to these people, right? Okay. Justice gives you what you deserve, right? But mercy gives you what you do not deserve. We don't, none of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve to go to heaven. None of us deserve any of the things that God gives us. Okay? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We don't earn revelation. When God, revelation reveal, when God reveals himself in many ways. We don't earn it, but a pure heart positions, is positioned to see God. We choose to live holy because it is the most, the, the only right way to live. Because in being holy, we can encounter God. And is the, the pleasure that, that destroys every wrong pleasure. It is the greatest pleasure, is to experience and encounter God. When God reveals God by the Holy Spirit to us, that is the greatest joy and delight for every human being, right? So, let's keep going. So, I don't want to keep you here all night. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This is the word heus, okay? It means mature, okay? It is impossible, Romans, um, Romans 12, 8, it says, If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peacefully with all men. We are commanded... You know, what if somebody just talks about you bad all the time and doesn't know why they, they're just mean to you? That's hard, right? I don't know what to do sometimes. I'm like, I try, you know, I try to, you know, maybe be nice and give gifts, whatever, and it just doesn't work. And they're still doing it. Do whatever it takes, the Bible says. Whatever it takes. And if it finally doesn't work, then okay, you've done it. God sees it, okay? Blessed are those who are persecuted... See, I am almost done, I'm thinking. Wow. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are reviled and persecute, and when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil things falsely against you, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Now this one's hard. To those who will rejoice when they're mistreated, persecuted, when evil is spoken against them, falsely accused, those are going to be blessed. You're going to have a vibrant spirit. You're going to be hooked up with God. If you, by faith, will rejoice and, and know that He is God. Know that He's got His eyes on you. He knows what's going on. Vengeance is His, not yours. And you can actually rejoice. Rejoice. Actually, um, it, it is a, a, not something we do because we feel like. I know that's weird, huh? It's something we do because of what we know, right? We know something deeper, something greater than the cir- current circumstance. We know some, someone more powerful. Someone who is the righteous judge. Someone who knows how to handle this case. Better than us. And we say, God, I trust you. My lips will praise you. My eyes are on you. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I will set the Lord before me. He's at my right hand. I will not be moved. Nothing will shake me. Nothing will cause me to move back. I will go forward. I will continue to trust. Everything tells me to back away, but my heart says yes to you. And by your spirit, I will lean on you and you will carry me. I trust you with all my heart. Second Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Paul is being uh, what, scourged or, or flogged. And for all these years, he, people are trying to stone him to death. He's going through all this affliction. He said, this light affliction, there's something good is coming, you know. It's just a moment, okay. Working far more, working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Romans 8, 
18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Like I said in the beginning, he is so much more interested in you being like Jesus than even to bless you. Even to give you a breakthrough. Even because, yeah, we all need it. Oh gosh, I need a breakthrough so bad. But see, he will allow in his wisdom what he can easily prevent in his power. Because there is a greater purpose for your life than just getting a breakthrough. There is a greater purpose for you than just being comforted. There's a greater purpose for you than having what all your needs meant. There is his most important agenda for your life is you look like Jesus. You talk like Jesus. You respond to those who hate you like Jesus. You say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do when they put the nails in your hands and feet. You love like Jesus. Greatness is Jesus. Okay. Now, these eight characteristics, Bible call, uh, many call the uh, Beatitudes, make us salt and light in the world. You are the salt of the earth, verse 13. But if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but thrown and out and trampled underfoot by men. In, back in those times, salt was used to what? Preserve food, right? From decay, rot, okay? Uh, we are the salt that keeps this community from decaying and dying. We are the only light that God has to shine in this world. That you're it. If you don't want to be it, fine, but you're it. He's picked you. He's going to make you look like Jesus because he is the light, the word made flesh, who dwelt among us and in him is life. And that light is the light of men. It is the only life source of this planet. Without you, this planet is covered in darkness. And you don't take darkness out by scooping it out. You turn on the light. Darkness, there's only one resolution for darkness. We don't focus on the darkness. We focus on the light and Through that light that we see, we reflect. Amen? You are the light of the world. You have a choice. You can hide the light. Keep it covered up. Private Christian life. Or you can have your faith made known public. And you can be, you can express that light. Not at church only. That very... But every single place you go. You can have a ministry at your work. You can be a pastor at your school. You can, you know, you can shine a light everywhere you go. It's just simply praying for people you meet. It's when God gives you something, don't be afraid to hold it back. When, when God allows you to have compassion for somebody, you don't know what to say. But that feeling you have came from God. You just don't love people out of nowhere. There's a, is a, an awakening of the heart to love people. Do something. Go say something. Start something. Step out. Okay? Now, salt can be contaminated with other minerals. And when that happens, the salt is only good. Back then, they use it to put on the road so people don't slip or whatever. And, the, and people walk on all over it. Or the stage coat or, you know. Horses, whatever. Okay? But if salt loses its flavor, then it's only good for nothing but to throw and trampled underfoot by men. When we lose our flavor, the world tramples all over us. That walks all over us. Okay? Religion tells us to separate from the world. And they use, be holy because I'm holy. And it makes kind of sense to the mind. Oh, no, you have to be in the world, but not of the world. You have to go and be the light to your neighbors and friends. You know, I used to go to uh, uh, this place in Hollywood where uh, transvestites would hang out, the men that sleep with other men for money. And I would actually take them out to lunch. 
Now, a Christian saw me, they would condemn me for that. You know? <laughs> I would drink out of the same cup just to let them know that I'm not judging them. You know, I would be their friend. You know, and uh, it might not seem like a wise thing to do, but is the the best thing to do. It might not look wise, but to me, it was wise because these people need mercy. They don't need me to go tell them what's wrong with them. They need to me to they need to know that some guy that's a Christian. You know, Christians are known for condemning them. This guy actually cares, willing by me lunch, and he have. Sometimes you don't even have to talk about Jesus. You don't start out with that at first. You got to get to know him first. What if every Christian decided, I'm going to get to know somebody and make friends with them and be there for them, give my time and my money for them? What if they did that for a few months for one person and then a few months for another person? The whole world would be saved by, by then, right? What if every Christian actually did this? You'd have a large church here, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. You are the light of the world. A city that is on the hill cannot be hidden. <sighs> what if there's a community of believers who walk in these eight characteristics, okay, who are poor in spirit, full of godly sorrow, meek, Hungry and thirsty for the things of God, merciful, pure of heart, peacemakers, and they can rejoice when they're being persecuted. What if that became what is normal and natural in a church? That would be a city on a hill, and all the world would come to it. Okay. There's a, a church that I believe is kind of like that. I, I, I I, I listen to all their teachings, by the way. It's a, a church called Reading, um, a church called Bethel in, Re- in Reading. I, I listen to everything they got. You know, it's what I do for fun, <laughs> listen to sermons. I know that sounds funny, but to me, it's the best thing, you know? Anyway, uh, Math 5.15 says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives light to all, the, to all who are in the house. What if you take a lamp? Back then, the lamps were not, you know, Ben Franklin wasn't around yet. There was no electricity. So you had to have oil in this. Uh, I don't know what it really looks like, but you had to have oil and you had to have a wick and you had to be in this container, okay? Okay. And you have to light the fire. If you put it under a basket, the fire loses air and it goes out. Okay. Now, how do we relate this? When we stop shining and we hide our faith, we are not public Christians. We're private Christians who don't really say or do anything but go to church and learn things of God. Our light, Jesus said in this example will ultimately go out. That's scary. That really scary. Okay. Okay, these lamps contain oil. Oil speaks of the Holy Spirit, intimacy with God, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit lights our lamp. Okay. He gives us ideas, messages. He inspires us to speak. What to say, when to say, how to say, who to talk to. Okay. Now there's ten virgins back in Matthew somewhere in 24, I think. Five was foolish and five was smart, wise. Five had oil in their lamp and five didn't. Virgins speak of Christians. But some didn't have any oil. When the time come, they couldn't go. Jesus had to say, or the bridegroom had to say, you know, had to shut the door behind him. Okay. Uh, so, I don't want to be a lamp without oil. That is my relationship, my time spent with Jesus, my intimacy with God, choosing to close the door behind me, and going to the secret place, whether I feel that he's there or not, 
Jesus said, if I close the door behind me, the Father is there in the secret place. It's not about your feelings. It's not about emotions even. Emotions are great, but when you don't have them, do what you know by faith, right? Okay. Okay. There's a wick that has to burn for this light. And the oil flows through the wick. Okay. If that wick is not burning, there is no light. What am I trying to say? We are supposed to be burning, shining lamps. When we stop burning, we not, do not produce any light. Those who are foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But those who are wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. Okay. Matthew 5.16. I'm almost done. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father is in heaven. Let your light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Remember that song? I like the song, but not so much. I want to be a burning and shining lamp. I want to be a little light. <laughs> now I know, I know what it means, you know. But I want to be full of oil. I want my wick to continue to burn. I want to be a witness everywhere. You know, most of my ministry isn't at church, you know. And if you don't have a ministry at church, fine. You have a ministry anywhere you go. Yeah. I, you know, I, I run into people everywhere. When you run into somebody three times a day or three times a week, that is a divine appointment. You know, you're supposed to talk to them. Most likely, okay? Same person out of nowhere, this big city, Houston, and you keep running the same person. There's your ministry. <laughs> Go talk to them. I don't know what to say. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Ask them what their name is. <laughs> That's a good start. I was at Andy's house. You know, I came there with a friend. And this lady, she could not pick up her watermelon. And she's looking around for somebody to help her because her shoulder's messed up. And I see her looking around. I was like, can I help you? You know, she's like, can you help me with this watermelon? I can't pick it up, you know. And she's trying to get it to, you know, she has this cart because she's going to push it up there, you know. So I pick it up, put it in there. I said, I was with a friend. I said, can we, I believe that God heals can we pray for your shoulder? You know, first, you know, I had a conversation to her, talk to her, got her name and things like that. And I said, can we pray for your shoulder? Well, so I, you know, told my friend, lay hands on her shoulder. I said, Lord, and there's no hyper spiritual or no, nothing magnificent about what I did. It was so simple. Lord, release your power on her shoulder. Lord, I thank you for loving her. You're not mad at her and you want her shoulder to be made right. And boom, it happened right in front of me. Now, she didn't jump up and down or anything. I just said, okay, let's see if you can pick up that watermelon now. She goes, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, she still has my friend's number right now. And she, uh, a few uh, days ago, she texted me, my shoulder is still fine. You know? <laughs> so, anywhere you go, just, how do you let the light shine? Pray for somebody, you know? You know? Give somebody a few bucks and, and ask them their name, pray for them. There's a lot of homeless people. You know, you can't give money to every single one of them, but once in a while there's somebody, you just feel something, just do it, you know. I, I always make sure you touch them, ask their name. You know, here's another ministry you can do. Every, decide today that everybody that you run into, that you have a conversation with, you're going to try to get their name and you're going to pray for them. With, you know, us guys, when we see a pretty girl, we get distracted, right? Pray for her. You won't get distracted the wrong way. Is that good? You're not going to lust for somebody if you're praying for her. Huh? Let your light shine before men. Uh, let's go. Let's read one more scripture text and then we're, we'll close. And I was afraid. Matthew 25, 25. I was afraid and went and hid your talent. 
And this is not just talking about money, guys. Every one of us. This has this gospel, which is the greatest talent you can have. Okay. In the ground, look, there you have what's yours. But his Lord answered said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I will reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. He hid his talent, or he hid his light. And Jesus didn't like it. Okay. I'm pretty quick today, huh? All right. We don't have a worship team or anything, right? Or, oh, Sammy's here. We can spend some little time, and, and uh, I don't know what to do. Really, I don't. But um, my prayer is that he would make us a city on a hill. And individually, he would not allow us to cower with fear, but let our light shine. My prayer is that we don't allow the flavor, the saltiness of who we are to fade away, but we actually preserve our community, our friends. You know, you, you, know, you are part of the community. God purposed for you to live here. He knows the time that you were born. He knows where you would live, and he put you there to shine. That community is not the world, so I stay away. No, that community is the world that you go, I go into to bring the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I ask that you would illuminate our hearts with truth and life. I ask that you would awaken love in us, Lord, to show mercy, to walk in purity, God, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, Lord, to walk humbly, gently, in meekness, Lord, to realize how poor we truly are, God. That we can truly rejoice knowing that you are for us and you have all power to deliver us. And when we go through hard times, that we would choose to rejoice, Lord. Choose to trust you, Lord. To identify that we are sons and daughters in your kingdom, Lord. That we would be a kingdom people, Lord. We would not just be part of a crowd, Lord, but we would truly be one of those Jesus hangs out with and is intimate with that will follow him have given our lives away have chosen to be discipled have given it all to you Lord God, we pray for those who are persecuted over in Iraq, Lord. Lord, I just heard that little children are being killed and they're having their heads chopped off, Lord. They're like trophies hung on a stick. Lord, we realize that the Antichrist spirit is, is rising in the earth. But when you, you said where the darkness increased, the light much more will increase, Lord. And God, even as these uh, people are out to get our brothers and sisters over there, Lord. I pray that the light and the glory of Jesus would rise in their midst, Lord, in their lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And here in America, Lord, as darkness covers the, the country, Lord, There is a promise of great light that will rise in these last days, Lord.